Um, before you all start eating your own fists, and I'll, I'll be as brief and as quick as possible, um, the, the whole idea about having information on the Youth Brain Trust came from the fact that there's one lady who works there who's called Leslie, and she kept getting bombarded by people wanting information. Uh, we decided, um, in league with, with Kath and the GA, that it would be easier if we put all this information onto a website and then you can easily access it and you can get it whenever you want. Uh, we are available if you need help. Um, you can get in touch with me. I suppose with you as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll leave our well, yes, we can leave our emails for you at the back if you wanted to, to walk around the area. What I would like to say is that we put an awful lot of information on there for the census. There's the 1881 census, the 1911 census, which is there along with some maps, um, and a walk, an illustrated walk, which has got nice photographs in it, nice black and white, to let you go around the area. So basically what we're thinking about is anything that we can do to make your lives, and especially the lives of your staff who must be um, under some degree of pressure, uh, a little bit easier, it's, it's where we will do it for you to help you get through. Um, the idea of the census, and you'll notice that there's only one date there, which is 1911. And the census for that one there you go, is taken every 10 years, except when there's a war. So 1941, there would be no census. Um, the census material is on the website. You can go and get it yourself if you want. You can go into either Blanford Street, the Discovery Museum, or you can go into the local studies. Both of them subscribe to something called Find My Past, which I came a cropper on, because I assume that you could just pay for a month's subscription, download everything that you possibly could before it sent you insane, and then use it. Um, Find My Past is cheeky, it will take money off you. Um, both of those agencies, Blanford Street and the local studies, they subscribe, they have subscriptions. So if you want to go in and go for 1861 for the used burn, you can do. But the format might be different, it's more difficult to work out because people's handwriting, it gets extremely creative and it's sometimes a bit difficult to work out what they're saying. 1911 was the best year I found because each household had its own sheet. Now remember this is secondary data. What you're going to be thinking of when you're doing your field work or your coursework is you have to have a balance between secondary and also primary. So are you going to use this in order to form a basis for your primary data collection and process? However, it's only released every hundred years. When you're looking for up-to-date census information, 1911 is the best you're going to get. So I rang up the little man at the Kew Gardens, where the archives is, and I said, why do you only, collecting all this data, why do you only release it every hundred years? It's all about data protection, so that you can't use somebody's birthplace, date of birth, and take over somebody's identity. So the most, most recent you're going to get is going to be 1911 for detail. The aggregated information you can get is very general, it's all about parishes and it's difficult to use in detail. The next release will be 2021. So the problem with the idea of up-to-date data, if you're going to do it, you could go and perhaps, you know, get it yourself. However, one of the things I must say to you is that you've got to remember copyright. Um, if you go on, say, a local studies website, or Newcastle Library's photo stream, or Flickr, there will be somewhere which says, be careful, this may be subject to copyright. You're all right if you say, with thanks to, or with permission from. And with the archives, we've got a special letter 
which is on the website saying that we are allowed to use the census data for educational purposes and information for examinations. So you are covered. You know, it's there. Staff can say with total impunity, we can use this. It's, it's smashing. It's okay. It's all going to be posted on the website. And there's a lot of information there. I did have a PowerPoint, and it was really good, because that little arrow shot round like a whirligig. Unfortunately, because it's a PDF, all my pop-ups are popped, and I can't do anything with them. However, what you, 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 can, you can derive a whole heap. And as I'm going through this, try and think about what John Smith was talking about, when he was talking about where all this is going to fit in your work, whether it's people's impressions, whether it's population density, whether it's the decline of industry. It's all there. I mean, it's a full package. And this isn't very good, but you'll be able to see something. It shows you a whole range of information. So it tells you, and this one, I'm called Cowans, but this is called Cowen. Cowen. Uh, it tells you how many people there are in the family. It tells you how, many, how old they are. It tells you um, whether you're married. It tells you what you're doing, what your occupations are. 1911 is past the peak. You're not getting as many people working in the heavy industry that you've got in Lewisburn. This guy's working as a quayside labourer. People are starting to spread out and go to different places to get their jobs. You will also get, which is nice, the number of children who attend school. It's important that you realise that education is coming in quite seriously for younger people. Another key sign, a labourer in the pottery. It also tells you there about workers, but it tells you also where they came from. And a lot of them came from Northumberland, from Biker. Remember, you've got people who are low income. They're not going to be able to just hop on a bus and turtle down to the Usburn because there's a job. They have to walk. So you are looking at distances which aren't too great. This is important because all of those people are living in one room. If you're talking about the way in which social development occurred in Usburn, you have people. This is quite a small family. There are some of eight and nine people. You're living with your granny and your auntie Flo and three small children. And where do they all go? Well, they're all thrown outside to the children to play. And when, at night time, there aren't enough beds, so you turn the table upside down, the children lie on the table, face of the table. It's, it's very, very poor in this kind of situation. There was an urban myth which talked about how do you find out where the poorest houses in Newcastle are? And the answer, you look in the, in the, outside the house near the grates, and you look for piles of tea, because the mums couldn't afford to feed the children, and they gave them tea as, a, as an appetite suppressant, and you put concentrate um, condensed milk in for sugar and milk, and you gave them a slab of bread with dripping on, and that was the food. And you wondered why many children had bowed legs, because of the lack of a decent uh, kind of diet. All of those people were living in one room. No toilet, no running water, no showers, no electricity, Windows that didn't fit, freezing cold in winter, steaming hot in summer. The conditions, the housing conditions were really bad. But this bit at the end is the bit that worried me, and because it says Crown copyright, that means it's it's serious stuff when it's the Crown copyright, because the Queen would come and say, can't do that. Crown images reproduced by courtesy of the National Archive of London. So we've covered that one. We've got the idea that you are allowed to use the information shown on this. And the reason the 1911 is nice, every single family has got their own little sheet. Thinking about the, the section that John Smith was talking about, he talked about the valley and the, the sort of physical makeup. Yes, you've got a river. Yes, it's, it's tidal. And yes, it was a lot bigger and wider than it is now. But one of the things that I thought it would be useful would be if you took a transept on one side, down Stepney Bank, along Lime Street and Ouse Street, and 
that will take you right along the side that's got most housing on. And then you look at Quality Row on the other side where you've got the heavy industry. So there are four streets with census data on that you could look at. You could find out patterns of employment, you could find about uh, people who work from home. The number of rabbits must have decreased amazingly because you had a lot of women who, who were actually like a furrier in, in, in their home and they processed the skins of rabbits in order to produce gloves and mitts and collars, cuffs and things for ladies who had posh clothing. So you had home workers and you had people living and working in quite seriously nasty industries. There's something on the website about Lizzie Dowson. She was 12 or 13 when she died. She worked in one of the, the white lead works. And we're talking here about children being sent out to work, we're talking about social industrial conditions. The white lead works made powder for lead paint. And it was very, very fine. And although the women stuffed their mouths and the men stuffed their mouths with rags and covered everything over, you still got into your lungs. And you knew you were dead when you let your lips and your gums had a blue line because it meant that your, your lungs basically were just melting with the lead. It was like poisoning. So many of the industries in the Usburn held a really serious health warning. If we're thinking about urbanisation and industrialisation, industries often had to be linked together because it was expensive to transport stuff, whether it was raw materials, whether it was lead, whether it was iron. And also John Smith said that the Usburn is full of invention and innovative things. It's one of the first places in Britain to have a mill race so that you could actually grind flint. And flint came as ballast in the ships. A ship which comes in with no bottom weight tips up. And what they did was they actually unloaded the flint, ground it, put it in clay, and it made really, really strong pots. And who was there to start off with? Mailings. And who made the jam jars for the jam for the marmalade people? Dewars? Mailings did, and they were right on the river. So it's all about being linked in. The sun came in as ballast. What do you do? What do you make glass with? Sand. So all of the industries as well, not only do you have a census, you have Ward's Dictionary, Ward, Ward's Dictionary, Ward's Business Directory, and it will tell you what industries and what premises were on the actual Lime Street, for example. There's Lime Street. So for example, at number 21, there was Jane Nelson and they were shopkeepers. Or uh, Jay Potts at number three, he was a coal merchant. So you could tell all the different occupations that people had just by using that. And I was asked to put this on as well, because remember the website. That's where you're going to get your information, or some of the information. Industrial linkages, if you had this, at that time, it can give you that. Flax was imported sometimes from Poland, Hemp for rope, sail plus the ships. But you can see what's going to happen, can't you? Because sails and ships declined, coal came in, and your industries might decline as well. Lead, 1960s, pottery, flint, sand, all of these linked together in the valley, along with people who wanted jobs, desperate for finding something. Uh, there's two nice little maps I did which shows you how the industries change. In 1900, you had something called a cattle sanitarium. If you were ill, you went to a sanitarium to get better. Cattle, sheep, pigs came in through the river, went there to prove that they weren't ill. Once they were all right, they were driven up to the slaughterhouses. From the slaughterhouses, they were skinned, and the leather was taken up Stepney Bank to where you had tanneries, and they smelled really bad. In the end, there wasn't a lot of spare space in the bottom of the valley. So, what can you do? How can you, how can you link it all into what John Smith was saying? Well, when you're looking at the census, how can you see it change? First of all, these are only going to be suggestions. They are prescriptive. It's if this idea attracts you, you can do it. So, 
are you going to look at the type of housing? Are you going to look at overcrowding? Are you going to look at sanitation? Or do you just like the, you know, the sort of Victorians or the Middle Ages, you just throw it out of a window and hope you don't hit somebody? But it went into the river and it smelt. I mean, it really did. There are all sorts of urban myths about it with the dam of dogs. When the dog, dead dogs created a dam, you had all the sewage behind it and eventually it burst and the smell and it all soared down into the river time. It was awful, it was horrendous, the smell. But you've got to remember that the used burn was tidal. You could walk across it if you wanted to. You could walk across it and the kids went to collect coal. What about renting property? Did you have one of, you were posh if you rented two rooms, that meant you were really coin in the money. Sewerage and water supply, you didn't have water until 1930s, 1940s, if you just used to have taps outside. Employment, was it heavy industry? What about the environment? And where did people come from? All of this you can glean from your original census data. If you look at the used burn now, totally different. People come from all over. There's no data on it. You would have to go out and find it for yourself. So being a kind person, here we have a map of Lime Street, and it's got buildings on it, and it doesn't show up very well, and I apologise for that. This is nice because it's got all the numbers of the buildings, so you can link that back to Ward's directory, and you can link it back to the census, so you know exactly where people were living. Numbers on that sheet make it much, much easier. And it's very difficult to see that because the lights on it, but trust me, they are there. You could process the data, you could shade it in, you could put a key on it, you could analyse it. But the important thing is, what other media could you use? The black and white are amazing for this area. And again, this came from data streams, local studies. And it's the back, I, think, I don't think it's the back of Lime Street, I think it's the back of one of the banks. But you always had the kids hanging around and they all posed, you know, smiling. You know, I'm as hungry as anything, but I'm going to smile for the cameraman. These were the two toilets, and I thought it was quite a nice little observation to show that the doors didn't face the houses. So that did, when you did go to the toilet, you actually went in and faced away, so nobody had to watch you going in. But remember, it's a pit, and everything goes into that pit. And the night soil men would come along with a little trolley, and they would dig it out for you. Everybody did different things. The Usburn was one of the recipients of all the horse manure which came out of the city, which was based on horses. So at the end of the river, you had these steaming masses of horse manure, which were then taken away and sent to farmers to use on the fields. It, it, it was interesting because a lot of the processes there, the smell was horrendous. So you could, you could look at black and whites. What could you do? You could go to roughly the same place and take a picture of what it's like now and do a comparison and contrast. So in the, in the good old days, there were very few of those by the way, you could see how many little children there were, what the, the wreck of a building is there, and is there anything there now? So take another one, for example, where we actually do know where it is. This is one side of Lime Street. And people lived in damp conditions. And there you've got the, the kids smiling, because they might give you some bread or something. But this bit goes below the bank. The houses were damp and difficult to live in. And all of them along this side of Lime Street, you could find it. You could say, this is what it was like. And this is what it's like now. There's nothing. There's no housing. And that one came from the Usburn Trust, and it gives you a bit more detail. Lime Street about this is 1935. You would think, wouldn't you, that it was God, it was awful. It was in the Victorian times. It was 1880. It was foul. This is this is 20th century. This is still what it was like for people living there. So would you like to go and compare and contrast social conditions? Urbanisation, people came here for jobs. Industrialisation, 
you had all of the ironworks. The maps are all there for you to look at. And this is Stepney Bank. That woman there is getting water from a pipe. When I had, when we were out doing some work um, on Stepney Bank, someone came up to us and said, that's my auntie. There she is getting, and it's a zinc bucket, I mean really, you know, healthy zinc. And they would live here in these houses. And then they were demolished. So you could, you know what it looked like then, you know what it will look like now, you know where the arches are, you could actually pinpoint it to see how it's changed. I said about the idea of being able to walk across the river. This is Lime Street Slipway. And you did have houses on both sides of the river, but on this side, the west side, far more. And these are the wherries which transported material up. So it was used as a north-south movement. So you had all of that area, but it wasn't going to last. It's still clear as 1930s, 1970s. But why? You remember what John Smith said about wider possibilities, what was influencing the area? Was it world sections of industry, multinationals? This is what it was like. Who'd want to invest in an area like this? Down from 1950s, rat infested, not very nice. Nobody's going to want to invest. I said about acknowledging where you get photographs from. I deliberately did that because it's, it's a guy who took photographs called Peter Loud. Some of his black and whites are very, very emotive. <laughs> you could compare what it looked like then to what it looks like now. That's actually where the city farm is now. So what happened? Well, city farm was built on a lead works, wasn't it, with polluted soil. So they had to then knock it all down, dig down about four feet and rebuild. But there's your ship in, just about at the top of your navigation point. Could you do black and whites? Could you use black and whites and could you compare? Think about the size of the valley, think about the width of the valley, think about what it's like now. Compare the land use on one side to the other. Could you do that? And then could you take a leap of faith and say why you think it happened? Whether it's urbanisation, industrialisation, whether it's competition from abroad, or is it like South Wales, where you didn't have any room for expanding and it was really, really difficult to make it work? Because ultimately it would, come, it would be too difficult for you to do anything in it. So can you follow through events? It's not a history project. It's an awareness raising project. Could you think about what it was like in 1911? This is your secondary data. What about the First World War? How many people went to, went to fight and they never ever came back? All factories went and they never came back, the boys. How about world events? What about the Depression? When all you had was a very small amount of money and you didn't get help with rent and you didn't get help with anything. You weren't on the Nash, you were just surviving. What about the Wall Street crash? That affected the world markets, did it affect here? Some clearance, Second World War, some clearance again. Do outside things affect this area? Now, is that urbanisation? Is it industrialisation? Is it the character of the use burn? How many people in this area lived through this time? In the 1930s, it was very difficult. Young men could not get a job. They got very fisticuffy with their, with their mums, with their wives, with their kids. So Dominic's at the top created, and this is where your social inequality came in, they created a gym in the valley floor and they encouraged all the young men who had no hope of anything to go there and work all their aggression out. Every pub had a trip out, get the men away, let give the women a chance. What did you, you used to do in your spare time? You looked after your pigeons because the pigeons didn't cost very much. And it meant you could go and talk to your pals and get away and relax a bit before you went home. 
to a, a pretty squalid, disastrous kind of environment. Are you going to be looking at things like that in your own head as you go through? Now, obviously, the reasons were new techniques. The ironworks was too, well, couldn't make, it couldn't modernise to save its life. Old fashioned practices, absolutely useless. Decline of shipping on the town, decline of traditional markets. The fall of the area led to vacant factories and loss of jobs. Environmental problems, where did they come from? Well, it was dying. One of the local authors used to go and play in the factories in the 1950s. They said it was brilliant. I mean, it's a, it's a health and safety nightmare because of glass and old machinery and flooded pits. They had a wonderful time. And yet, it didn't help anybody because there were no jobs and people moved away. So you're looking at people leaving the area, no labour force, their skills weren't wanted, Decline of the infrastructure, no new roads, steep roads going down somewhere like Stepney Bank, and the industrial linkage didn't work anymore. So it died, basically, until the 1970s. And it came to the attention of, unfortunately, it was the, um, the redevelopment of the river. And the Tiny Way Development Corporation thought, wow, we spent all our money, we've made the, made the quayside look like the Riviera, on the picture anyway, and we've got yachts and things sailing up and down, it's wonderful. Um, ooh, what's this bit? It's the, it's the used Burn Valley, I mean, uh, oh, it's all those buildings, why do we just knock them all down and build something else? Up comes the used Burn Trust blessing and say, hang on, there's, there's buildings here of enormous value, like for example Seven Stories, like for example 36 Lime Street, like, for example, all the old pubs that you can get there, the old buildings, the, the Victoria Tunnel, and they protected it. Otherwise, a lot of it could have just been lost. So, are you going to look at that as secondary data and go around and see what there is? There is a cafe there with an actual pottery kiln in. You can watch the guy making pots while he's sipping a latte. Um, you can go to the Usburn Coffee Place and have coffee. You can go to Ernest's and have something nice to eat. You can go and bop your life away in um, Clooney, that'll do. You can go to the Clooney, and there's lots and lots of areas there where you've got music stages, you've got areas of artistic creativity, you've got areas where you have printers, you have areas where you have photographers, all of these different things that you have different kinds of employment with different skills. And it could be somewhere like the Toffee Factory, which was where you used to get your Maynard's wine bottles made. Could you go there and could you see how many people are actually working there and where do they all come from? Because they're all doing something different. So think about it. Where are people working? Think about your primary data. Can you take photographs? Do you want to do some map work? Do we want to look at the used birds it was, where it was horrible and grotty? And then you've got water coming in. Now, we have the pigeon creeds. Very, very popular. They've been left to die. But remember that it will get, them, get men out of the house, give them something an alternative to actually look at. But then, of course, you come to this bit that uh, John Smith was talking about. Shoebox factory, which is here. It's on the shoeboxes, the mailings. And then you've got Steamworks, which is on the other side. Now, if you look at the prices of these properties, you are not encouraging lots and lots of people to come back and live in the Usburn. You're encouraging certain people to come in who've got lots of disposable income, and it's not social housing, trust me. You do have an area near to the river, near to the bridge, which is called Farm View, which is really nice, and it's an area where you do get people who are vulnerable, and they can get a really nice little apartment there, and they are cared for a bit further up the valley, not near the river, just up near the bridge, opposite the ship. And it's, it's a nice area for them to live. People live in Usburn. You know, landladies live there. People live at the top of 36 Lime Street. There are flats all over. 
but it's not like it was. And of course you've got this lovely design feature here, which fits right in with the glass bridge, and it's sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, most of the time it sits there. But you could have two areas for housing development. Could you take, I think it'd be quite difficult to interview people who live there, but they built into a dream, they built into a community, an artistic community, a coffee community, an area where you do get art, where you get music, but it's really difficult for people who live there to begin with who bought into the area just to get a job and get it to it. So that's something else you can think of. Steenbergs, in mine, I keep calling it Spaceship Enterprise, it looks like it. Um, how they're going to manage to fit it in that dinky area, I've got no idea. But this is all about giving you help and ideas. I'll put my email on there if anybody wants to get in touch with me. You can, if you want any help, you can get that as well. Go on the Usable and Trust's website. There are shed loads of things on there. Really easy to access. You've got permission to download what you want and it's all there for you to, to go and just pick it up. Go on something like Newcastle's Flickr, photo stream, you get lots of photographs. If it doesn't work, just use Snip Tool. That's what I do. Yeah. You know Snip Tool, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just snip it off. And then you can mm -hmm. just use it in your, in your piece of work. But say, we're thanks to, grateful thanks to. Yeah? All right. There you are. Oh, wow, I finished before 7 o'clock. Yay! You can go now. Yes.